Welcome everyone, good afternoon and uh, welcome to a session which forms part of the Careers Services Green Careers Festival, which we are running in association with Cambridge Zero. I'm delighted to be joined this afternoon by Gavin Horton. Gavin is a scientific officer based within the office of the Chief Scientific Advisor at DEFRA and he's going to be talking to us about his career path to date, including of course his current role within science engagement in the government. So we hope that there will be time for questions at the end of Gavin's presentation. So do please pop them in the chat as we go along. But otherwise, over to you, Gavin, and thanks. Okay. Thanks, Sally. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about my career path, but I'm going to weave into that some examples of some of the good choices I made of trying to reach out. So I'll be dropping a couple of names of places you can go to to find similar sort of opportunities to get good experience that will help boost your CV. So uh, we'll start with uh, my studying geology as an MSci student. And with that geology, I then at the end of the MSci, uh, I managed to get a project where I was working with GIS to map the seafloor. And this really introduced me to GIS, which is where most of my career came from after that. And after that MSci finished, I managed to get in contact with the British Exploring Society and that's a group which can they take a level students really off to exotic locations like the Himalayas and the Amazon and such but if you join as a trainee leader which you can do after you finish say your degree so I joined that as a trainee leader and that way you get a massive discount on going so you can go to these exotic places without spending lots of money so I went as a trainee leader to teach geology for that. So that was a six week trip to the Himalayas and you get lots of experience in sort of leading these groups. Um, you've got first aid as well, but also teaching geology. And that's just a sort of six week thing you can do after you finish university that will help bolster your CV. Also, while I was doing my undergraduate, I got some work at the British Geological Survey over the summer so using those summer holidays to really try and get internships or some work experience even if it's just a week or two and i got that line by reaching out to they knew anyone who worked in these areas after that um, i managed to get a phd so my phd was in marine geology so i used those gis skills that i got from my msi to do a phd in this and that was a four-year phd researching sort of mid-ocean ridge crusts, trying to find the relationship between faulting and tectonism there. One of the good opportunities to look out for is when you're doing a PhD is any of the conferences you can go to. So there's lots of conferences and these are all sort of things you need to take the initiative to apply and produce posters and presentations. And again, if you, you get to do a lot of traveling with a PhD, if you're doing it to go to a conference because it's funded through your research, so using that, I got to go to uh, the American Geophysical Union, Geoscience Union in the US. Also went to an Interridge conference in China. There's the European Geoscience Union is in Vienna, the Primes conference in Scotland. And there's some other opportunities where it was a sort of mining field trip training that, that was taught by Rio Tinto and other groups to teach you how to do geology in the field for mining. And that was in Milos in Greece. So those are examples that you can do the PhD, but then there's these extra opportunities you can work towards as well once you're in that. And the real sort of reason of doing the PhD is geology is very interesting and such, but it, it did give me that opportunity to sort of think of where I wanted my career to go. I wasn't the jobs I was applying to at the end of my MSI weren't that exciting. So I wanted to sort of do something that would give me that extra bit. Um, if your undergraduates think you're doing a PhD, then just say in the comments after and I can tell you a bit more about what that experience is if you want to learn more. But also part of that process was doing cruises. So to gather my data for my research, I did a cruise to the Panama Basin near Galapagos and to the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And they're six week long cruises to really scan the sea, giving me a lot of experience in using different GIS techniques and actually using the equipment itself. So from that, I then went to the Environment Agency uh, and that wasn't to do with geology at all, but that was really because of those GIS skills that I'd built up doing geology. They wanted me to 
on a short term contract to produce a mapping program for the environment agency that would map natural flood defenses. So entirely different. I'd never done geography before, but this was a real geography role using the skills I'd picked up doing geology. So it's those software skills that you learn at university that is going to help you get the jobs later. At the environment agency, there was also these conferences you can go to, natural flood management conferences, great opportunities to network. And once you're in that environment, you've got business conferences. So your first job, good opportunity to then start going for uh, geo business is a great GIS work area. There's programs like Coursera, which are online training courses where you can get some extra leadership uh, training, but also using stuff like ecosystem services, which I hadn't done before because I wasn't doing geography, learn extra stuff like that through online training and you can get that all funded for your work. Sometimes you may be able to get it through your university as well. There was then a series of short term contracts within the environment agency um, going to be a GIS analyst. I was doing some more sort of general work on just getting down to the GIS of creating these maps and then a more spatial technician, which was the implement like how do you use those maps? And then I swapped over to DEFRA last year for science engagement uh, within the chief scientific advisor's office. So this is a chief scientific advisor who's from he's a Oxford professor that helps to advise DEFRA on its policy and we cr uh, create these expert groups of other academics from all different universities to come and check DEFRA policy to make sure it's scientifically rigorous before we go and implement it. So I help to run these various committees to get them together, uh, write up their minutes and the reports. But there's also gathering stats on these groups, trying to compare them to each other and engaging with universities to set up events and also sort of uh, help set up our own PhD pro uh, programs within DEFRA. But the main points that I wanted you to take away from that story, uh, going back from the M side to here, is those extra opportunities that you need to look for that are helpful in building that CV and stuff like the British Exploring Society. Kind of get a nice holiday with it, but you also get to gain those leadership abilities and those other skills that you can put in your CV. The conferences, the business conferences like oceanology and geo business, specifically for GIS, they're not careers fairs, but they're where the companies come together to swap ideas and change. But students are allowed to go to those as well. So going to those business conferences and you can find them online if usually just typing in your uh, subject or such with a business conference after. They're usually free, uh, not all of them, but you can go to them and talk to people who are actually who are in business and work in there and they will give you lots of hints and tips and you can pass them CVs. And then there's also online training opportunities. While I was at the Environment Agency, there was a leadership course, six week leadership course went on that. Uh, these were lecture stuff you have to apply for and that gives you a whole load of new skills that you can use as well. Websites like Coursera were useful for just because I didn't do a, ge a geography degree using Coursera to then learn about ecosystem services and some of these other areas just to help widen out uh, sort of what you know. Uh, yes, so should I go to the questions now, Sally? I can't remember if that was what I was saying before the microphone started having issues, but yes, absolutely. If you if you don't mind going from the top down, Gavin, for the questions that we've had, that would be really kind. Thank you. Sure. Great. Uh, so there's one about humanities students. Yeah, so this was. When you go to an interview in the civil service, you furnish to fill in these forms uh, before you get to the interview stage. It's not so much as submitting a CV, but filling in an online application. That they'll be looking for sort of skills based questions, sort of what is uh, gives examples of your leadership abilities and stuff like that, and that there'll be you'll see a, a large document about it where they break it down to sort of I think about six different categories and those categories have a, about a table of 60 different words that they're using and there's very specific definitions for what they mean by leadership. So use that document to really structure your answers and structure them around the star format. So the situation, uh, task, action and result because that's the structuring they need to hear so that when they're filling in their assessment forms on the other side, they're being able to tick off the boxes in the correct order. So it's all very structured, the answer there. And coming from humanities background, you can still be showing all those leadership 
um, they won't be asking so many technical questions unless it's a very specific technical role, but certainly any sort of team working experience you have, any uh, leadership examples or self-learning uh, you, you go you do courses that are extra to what you needed to do and so learning that's going to sort of fill in those criteria so yeah it's, it's it's not that you'll be so much interviewed based on what your subject was but on the skills that you acquired while doing that and that's why that extra ability extra curricular stuff is important just looking through the other questions Yes, we've had something from Julia there, uh, which I was unaware of, but um, obviously observing us from the point of view of something that they're working on. Um, I believe we have another question coming in from Lauren. Um, yeah, so just if we give the next couple of minutes over to some quick typing from folks, that would be lovely. And, yeah. um, Feel free to also just unmute and yeah, no, shout at me, so that's fine. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Gavin. I don't really want people to shout, but that's great. So could you outline what your current role is a bit more? So what you do, because you seem to be like the junction between, is it like science and policy and just like, yeah, that's yeah, exactly what you do. Yeah, so I do a lot. So it's quite hard. To, it's, it's not in my old GIS roles. It's very specific on I was just doing mapping in this role. The, the chief scientific advisor's office really works on. It is that junction between science and policy. You've got all the policy coming down and you've got teams working on that, but we want to make sure that it's properly vetted by external scientists. So part of my job is putting together teams to of these academics to then assess that policy. So for example, we've got, uh, you've probably seen it in the news, there's particularly smelly landfill that's causing a lot of issues uh, with air pollution. So we've assembled a team of academic experts to then vet the work that the EA and the landfill owners are producing, just to make sure what they're saying is backed up by the data they're putting forward. So we've got that independent criticism and we've got another one of those for exotic diseases as well, like swine flu and bird flu and such. Um, so those are some of the groups I organise. There's also communicating with all the universities in the UK to try and find out what doctoral partnerships they're part of. Um, we want to set up our own PhD programme in DEFRA, so it's sort of laying the groundwork for that. There's an assessment of all of the scientific advisory those scientific expert groups across DEFRA, you know, there's dozens of them. Um, there's so many we're not even quite sure like what is out there. So we're having to, well, I'm assessing that, pulling in all the data from those groups, the pay, who's involved with it, everything like that, what their purposes are to try correlate between the different roles to make sure that DEFRA's got scientists in the right places to be covering all of the sort of upcoming topics and you know, we don't have any research gaps. It's very broad and it's always changing. So um, it, when you're in the civil service, you rarely stay to one role for long. There's always, it's always moving and there's always new opportunities to get and you can have quite a lot of freedom in choosing where you want to go work-wise. Uh, people will email around and say, I've got this new bit of work. Does anyone want to take part in it? So you have that opportunity to sort of put yourself forward. Thanks. Can I, I want to ask thank you. you. <laughs> yeah. Yes, please. Thanks, Gavin, for that. Um, I just wanted, um, so my question was the one about sort of humanity student coming in. Oh, yeah. um, and you mentioned just now that your work sort of is obviously a science aspect, but there's also the policy work, which I was wondering whether the policy side of things is something you sort of picked up on your way into DEFRA, um, or if that's something you've kind of learned while you've been at DEFRA. Um, so that was one thing. And then secondly, kind of leading on from that, if we're sort of interested in policy, can you recommend any sort of, you mentioned Coursera, anywhere else that we could sort of kind of build our knowledge and skills in that yeah. area? Yeah. Thanks. So I didn't know much or care particularly much about policy before. I did because I came very much from the science perspective, it's all about data. But while at the Environment Agency, it sort of came more and more important that the policy side is you've got that top-down approach 
Um, so learning about the policy really defines what science you're going to be set on to do. So that involved me more in trying to get more involved with the policy. So you get in there at an earlier stage. Um, and there's loads of, once I started looking into that, so you see the IPCC reports and uh, sort of the 25 year environment plan is another one. There's um, uh, the zero, recently we've had the net zero policy that's being published and it's trying to get involved into the conversations that happen behind those giant reports that are published. Um, and a lot of those discussions are with experts and academics that then discuss that. So that, that was an interesting way in. Um, and what was your other point? Sorry. Sorry, <laughs> thanks. That was very helpful, Gavin. Um, just about sort of how, any recommendations you have or advice mm. oh, on how yeah. we can pick up sort of a better understanding of policy and some skills in that area? The blogs go on the civil service website and uh, .gov website and you can subscribe on the side to uh, articles and you can then filter it by departments so or whether you just want DEFRA articles or Bayes articles and in those you'll have the, the small blogs that will come through and there'll be lots of links usually on the articles that are posted that will send you to the right reports but importantly those blogs have the contact information for whoever wrote it and they'll be specific to a team that you may be interested in so you can then follow up that contact with can I speak to you more about this uh, to learn more about the work you've done and they usually reply they're quite good responding. That's brilliant, thanks. Yep. Stephanie, I think you also had a question just about the finding the document of the civil service application that Gavin spoke about. Yeah, it's the civil service success profiles. Um, so if you Google that, you'll be able to find the documents that will go for it. And it'll be any time you apply for a civil service job, um, there'll be links during the application process, there'll be links to it, to that document. So if you can't find it by Googling that, just to try applying for one of the jobs and it will send you to those links. So they're quite forward about exactly how they want you to answer the questions, but it is a very different process to if you're applying to jobs in business. Um, okay, that's really helpful. Thank you very much for everyone for your questions. Um, if you have any more, unmute now, <laughs> but otherwise, um, Gavin, I think we can draw the session to a close just to pass on the thanks from the Career Service and from Cambridge Zero for joining us and speaking so clearly about what your career path to date. Stephanie, you have your hand up. Yes, sorry, I wanted to jump in really quickly. No problem. Um, uh, Gavin, just on the um, civil service blogs, would I find that if I just go onto the civil service website, is it really straightforward to find? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to Google it quickly. Uh, thanks. Because it should be. Yeah, it should be here. I'm just going to pop in the chat. Uh, and then you just got to you know, apply the right filters or just Thanks search so terms, what you're looking for. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Yeah, no worries.